Thank you for, for attending the virtual open house on the Global Health Graduate Programs at, at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, my name is Kelly Curtis. I'm one of the admissions officers. I would like to introduce Dr. William Brigger, program director. I will now turn it over to Bill for him to share some information about himself. Okay, this is uh, Bill Brieger. I want to uh, welcome you all to the meeting. Uh, hopefully you'll learn some about the program and share what you've learned with other people. Uh, right now I'm uh, based at the uh, Department of International Health in the uh, School of Public Health, um, Johns Hopkins University, the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I've been full-time there since 2002. Prior to that, I was a professor at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria for 26 years in the African Regional Health Education Center. Um, and we uh, did quite a lot of work on primary health care, on health systems, and a lot of that experience has been uh, turned into the courses that I teach now and then serves as sort of the basis for the different programs we're going to be discussing tonight. I also work with an NGO called Japigo based at uh, Johns Hopkins. They're involved in uh, family health, maternal and child health, and I'm there also their malaria specialist. So again, thank you and welcome uh, to, to our session. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, the agenda for this evening, we will cover the industry overview, program details, the curriculum, faculty, uh, more about online learning, the admissions requirements, financial aid, and we will end where you will be able to uh, type in your questions, and we will try to answer as many of those that we can. Bill, I'm going to turn um, this next slide over to you. Okay. Uh we are titling our programs Global Health. We're in the Department of International Health, and people say, well, is there a difference? What is the difference between global health and international health? And uh, you can see on the slide our uh, current chair um, of our department, David Peters, has tried to address this. And uh, you have a link there where you can read the, uh, the full uh, article you know that he has written but basically we're concerned with health and equity and multidisciplinary uh, action to improve health um, across many populations we're concerned about people who are not well served underserved populations and so and we're concerned about strengthening systems so whether you call it global health whether you call it international health uh, basically it comes to the same difference we're built on the Amata declaration which was uh, created in a conference in 1978 this is the 40th anniversary of Amata they called for health for all recognizing the importance of many sectors, including health, in strengthening people's health, recognizing the importance of community involvement. So these are themes that run throughout both global as well as uh, international health. And both of those you know, are um, themes that you will see in, in our courses. In the um, next slide, we again talk about the background of our department. Um, our department was founded in 1961. It was the first academic program in international or global health uh, in uh, the U.S. Uh, the mission of the uh, department is uh, seeking understanding of health problems and trying to find uh, affordable solutions to reduce disease, to protect people's health, uh, and as I said before, with underserved populations around the world. Our department is concerned about um, populations we have with people working in Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America, uh, the Pacific. We have uh, people working with underserved populations of uh, uh, immigrants in the U.S. with the uh, Native American populations in, in North America. So again, this issue of working with underserved populations is a very important thing and understanding how systems can help them or how systems may need to be reformed in order to uh, 
meet their needs. Uh, the department's been involved, obviously, in research, education. Uh, we're very much uh, concerned about new ways of uh, educating uh, health professionals of new learning modalities and this is why we've set up you know our own opal operations we have uh, so several different formats um, and platforms that go beyond the traditional school-based education so we're glad to have you all potentially involved in this uh, outreach to us uh, to strengthen the global health uh, workforce uh, so these are some of the issues that, that we're working on, and as you can see uh, the links below, you can learn more about the department. Okay, in the uh, next slide, a major question that comes up, uh, whether people are applying for our Master of Applied Science or any of the other programs that we offer, is what do people in global health do? <laughs> Why is, is there a career? Um, and there are many different things that people do. They work for a variety of health and development agencies. Uh, these may be donor agencies, agencies that provide support, uh, financial and technical support, such as the U.S. Agency for International Development and specialized programs uh, that they offer, such as the President's uh, uh, the PEPFAR, uh, the Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, or the President's Malaria Initiative. Uh, the Another uh, major actor in the field is the uh, Department of uh, for International Development, DFID, uh, the British uh, aid agency. Uh, there are similar agencies, Canada, Sweden, around the world, the EU uh, has uh, development, health and development agencies. And so staff either who, um, you know, are there and need uh, continuing professional development would take courses like this. Uh, and also people who are um, planning in the future to get involved in, in global health and working with underserved populations uh, and want to work with such agencies would try to get a credential in, in global health. Uh, we hope that the course will be attractive uh, and, and can reach uh, uh, people actually working in middle and uh, low-income countries. Uh, these may be government agencies like ministries of health. Uh, yes, people can get a job in a ministry with, uh, with a first degree, but often they have a better chance for promotion, uh, a better chance for, for uh, working on more technically complex programs if they do have additional degrees, if they do have continued professional development. So people who are working in government agencies, NGOs, um, in, in the uh, low and middle income countries. And then, of course, there are uh, global health agencies that are multilateral, such as the uh, Global Fund, uh, which has pro provides a program uh, pro provides funding for AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, UNICEF, uh, the World Health Organization, uh, UNDP. The World Health Organization, of course, has branches, regional offices in Africa, the Americas, Western Pacific, etc. So these are just some of the places where people can find careers in global health, uh, whether it's at the um, national and local level in an, a country, a uh, low and middle income country, or whether it's an agency providing technical or financial assistance uh, to work with underserved populations. And then we can look at some of the details of the program. We have um, three programs that we're, we're offering uh, this, this time around. They'll start in September. And this is why we're encouraging people to apply now. I think it'll be mentioned that the applications will close in July. Uh, but again, mentioning, having mentioned those careers, we hope that these programs will equip students with the skills so that they can uh, provide sustainable solutions, be, uh, make contributions to the health and welfare of uh, people in uh, low and middle income countries, uh, underserved people throughout the world. And again, we're looking at this in a global context for beyond borders, because as we know, people tend to move, uh, populations don't stay still. So throughout the world, we start off with our uh, certificate, 
in global health practice. This also serves as year one for the two master's degree. So people can take the certificate alone or they can enroll in the master's program and the first year of study would be equivalent to the certificate, which they would again get at the end of that, but then they could continue on. But there are people who already have some advanced degrees and simply want the certificate. Uh, and that is uh, offered for 25 credits. We have terms, eight week terms. So uh, we would offer a minimum of two courses of a minimum of six credits total uh, during an eight week term. Uh, so that would be one academic year if you have, uh, are able to take uh, two courses per term and complete the certificate. Uh, if you've registered for a Master of Applied Science, you would then go on to the second year. And we have two different choices for the second year, but of course you need to indicate which one you want when you apply in the first place. Uh, we do have provision that at the end of the certificate year, if people decide that they want to go beyond the certificate and they did not apply originally for a master's degree, they can go back to SOFUS and apply again for the master's and then continue on. But we have, um, again, two um, master's uh, of applied science in global health. We have the uh, community-based primary health care programs. Uh, that, again, involves uh, the first year of the certificate, a second year of another 26 credits, where there are courses dealing with community-based programming, uh, working community involvement, um, planning, um, those types of activities. So people who want to get into running community programs, managing community programs, involving the communities in healthcare, uh, this would be the master's for you. Uh, then the Master of Applied Science in Global Health Planning and Management uh, deals with people who would be more in uh, ma managing, running the programs, mid-level people, uh, people working in, in ministries, uh, people who would be, um, be responsible for major programming in NGOs and uh, you know, be uh, focused on that. We want to make sure that people have practical ex you know, experience in these, both either of these areas by having uh, what is called an integrative activity at the end where they are able to um, work on a project that they have decided trying to bring the skills that the, and, and ideas that they've learned from the two from their coursework uh, together with understanding a practical problem on the field where where they are based um, we do have a focus on gaining skills and with any kind of program like this that has a skill base or professional orientation, um, it does um, help if people have some uh, background. We do require for the masters, for the degrees that we uh, people have two years of some type of health related experience so that uh, they have a foundation to build on. And this is true for any student coming to Johns Hopkins. One of the uh, things that people are encouraged to do uh, when they arrive is to examine what they are bringing to the program that they can build on. So that we assume that everybody, these are everybody's, uh, it, this is adult education as it were, and everybody's been working, bringing something to uh, the program. Um, and so we want to build on that. Um, the interesting part of this compared to some of our other programs at Hopkins is this is completely online. So people do not have to come to Baltimore. They don't have to go to any other uh, location to take courses. They can take everything uh, by way of internet. Um, it is part-time in the sense that you can take, you, you would not take a full course load, which would be something like uh, 16 to 20 hours uh, if in, a, in one of the terms, uh, but um, we have it available that there are at least two courses available each term. Uh, we you know, recognize that some people in order to get scholarship need to be enrolled in a minimum of six credits. 
Uh, we recognize that there are other people because of their work or family commitments may not be able to take two courses each term. Um, for the certificate, you have a maximum of three years to complete. For the master's degrees, you have a maximum of four years to complete. So people can, you know, tr technically finish the program in two years if they take the uh, available two courses each term, or they can spread it out depending on their personal situation. Uh, we do try to make sure that we have a variety of learning methods, uh, learning from each other, group activities, uh, peer assessments, uh, interactive discussion forums, uh, and, and again, the projects that we, we focus on, especially the integrative activity, uh, try to get people hands-on experience. Um, it's, we, we try to, with all of our online courses um, at Johns Hopkins, we do try to get people to draw from the environment around them, their work environment, their community environment, uh, to bring in their experiences from that environment to enrich their learning in the classroom. So on the next slide, the print is a little bit small, but obviously if you can uh, increase your screen size, I'm not sure if people were able to download this, but uh, if you, you can certainly on the pamphlets and things you've written away for, um, you can see that um, this year one, as we said before, also serves as the certificate, and we have four terms in a year, and so uh, we have a minimum of uh, two courses uh, that are available. The academic, the academic research and research ethics course um, is required of any student who is uh, in Johns Hopkins University. Um, so that's this, and it's uh, not for credit, but um, it's important that you that everyone take this. But then we have um, uh, seminars in public health, which um, is something that is offered to all students taking a master uh, one of the courses in our uh, um, Opal series, and uh, make sure that everybody has the basic. Um, Basic, exposed to the basic skills for public health, um, for education and public health. Then we have our own introductory course, the Fundamentals in Global Health Practice. The second term, we're looking at uh, ethics uh, in global health practice. Uh, this is a major issue uh, that, that comes around the world. You know, people are coming from one country to help people in another country. People from cities and universities are going to rural areas to help poor people. Um, you know, what are, how do you ethically interact with people you're trying to help? We, we deal with those issues. Um, we want to look at the basic issue of designing primary health care programs and projects. Uh, as a foundation for everyone. Again, the, the certificate serves as a foundation um, in and of itself and for the uh, two uh, master's programs. The OPAL uh, program offers an introduction to epidemiology because this is public health. And paired with that, we have our own global epidemiology um, policy and program course that looks specifically at the issues in the global health context. We are then um, having in the fourth term uh, access to the, again, the broader OPAL course to introduce people to statistical concepts. And um, then we're looking uh, specifically at the social and cultural components of organizing a uh, global health program, uh, whether this is at the community level, uh, whether we're talking about improving health organizations or whether we're talking about improving uh, the policy making process to support health. What are the, the behaviors um, of people at all these different levels that influence having quality uh, public health and global health programs? So that would complete the first year. And as I said before, people doing the certificate would, would stop there. Um, people who go on to the second year, the, either of the master's degrees would still get the certificate, um, and then they will go further. If 
you know, in the fourth term, you realize that you've signed up for the certificate, but you do want to continue. There is time of it, you know, to apply for continuing on in the uh, through SOFAs to continue on in the master's degrees. Okay, then we have our um, second year for the planning and management. And what we will be doing there, as you can see, we're looking at issues ranging from um, the well, the, the course, the health and safety preparation is for both master's degrees, actually. Uh, we, we And we provide this course to any of our students at Hopkins who are traveling out for field placements. Uh, it's an important skill set to learn of how do you get yourself ready to go to another country setting uh, to, to work. What do you do for your own health? What do you do for um, getting ready in terms of some of the, the practical issues of traveling? Okay, then, then specific courses for the planning and management uh, masters are uh, looking at pharmaceutical policy. One of the major concerns we have is getting commodities, public health commodities to people. Um, it's not enough just to to have the you know these facilities open. We have to have uh, medicines, we have to have supplies, we have to have diagnostics. So how do how does that work? Um, then we're also looking at um, our frameworks for health systems. We're trying to understand how a health system works. What are some of the different components and issues? Comparing and contrasting health systems in different countries. Um, we're concerned about quality uh, management. Uh, we're concerned about um, the issues of um, strengthening health information systems. These are all co various components. One, one thing we'll note is that WHO talks about six basic building blocks for a health system. And those building blocks certainly look at the commodities, they look at the services, they look at the human resources, they look at the information flow. And these are some of the, the issues, the strengths that will be uh, built for students so that they can understand these components of health management uh, in, a, in a global arena. Okay, then in the year two of the community-based primary health care programs, uh, we are going to be looking at the issue of commodity logistics in terms of getting these things to the village level. Uh, we're going to be uh, examining how to evaluate uh, primary health care programs in the community. We're going to be looking at, many, many people think about rural areas when you're talking about primary health care, but we also recognize that there's a, a major component of urban health. Many underserved people live in urban areas. The world is growing and urbanizing quickly. So uh, we want to address primary health care in that level. Uh, we, again, need data to plan our community programs, and so survey methods will be uh, reviewed. We have um, a course on training. Uh, this is one of the key things if we're talking about village health workers, community health workers, frontline health workers who train and supervise community health workers. You know, how do you organize uh, training, continuing professional development for those people? And we will focus on that in one of our courses. Um, and finally, we'll be looking at community capacity uh, in our fourth term of the second year in the primary health care program. And again, there'll be an integrative activity where people uh, will be uh, guided to um, examine health problems. We'll have a variety of approaches that you can use in terms of whether you're assessing a program you worked with or are work currently working with, whether you're doing a review of literature to understand um, similar programs or, uh, in other countries and what's been done, what are the, some of the common interventions, what works and doesn't, uh, or developing a proposal you know, for, for a new program. So these are some of the things that you can do to try to integrate what you've learned. On the next slide, you can see we have uh, quite a variety of people teaching these courses. Um, let's note that uh, I'm the director of, of the overall global health learning programs, and I'm assisted by Christina Salazar, who uh, 
you know helps us with all of the the, the major challenges. Uh, one of the important things was uh, helping us get our proposals together. We have to uh, any any time there is a, a new degree or a, a new certificate program, uh, especially if there's an online or off-campus program, we have to get uh, approval from the uh, Maryland Department of Education before we can offer anything. And so uh, this is one of the key things, for example, that Christine has been doing is helping us prepare our, our proposals and presentations to get approval to offer this to you all. But we have people who are from all around the world, from uh, Pakistan, the India, uh, people who have worked in, in Africa, in, uh, Asia, people who are specialized in epidemiology, people who uh, have experience in managing NGOs, uh, people who uh, are specialists in pharmaceuticals and commodities. So people who, um, again, we've been talking about ethics, people who have experience in terms of ensuring program ethics, uh, systems thinking. So there are quite a number of us. Uh, many have worked in the area of various kinds of uh, disease control programs. So they'll be bringing all that experience uh, to you, to the, uh, to the lectures. Um, and hopefully, again, this will inspire you for some of your practical activities uh, in your integrative experience. It's important on the next slide, you can see that online learning has been something that Johns Hopkins has been involved in for quite a number of years. Uh, it started with some uh, in-service courses for staff of the U.S. Uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the mid-1990s. Um, actually, I started teaching online courses for Johns Hopkins in 1996. Uh, and uh, so again, we've expanded our offerings, uh, not just for uh, the online programs for our existing degree programs, but creating new programs. We have programs in Coursera and now these new uh, offerings uh, via OPAL, the Masters of Applied Science and the associated uh, certificates. Uh, so we have a very strong production team, our Center for uh, Teaching and Learning, that uh, you do uh, instructional designers, web developers uh, who help us put together all of our lectures. And if you ever have technical challenges with, uh, with, with any of the courses you're taking, uh, you know, with the website, et cetera, these people respond on their helpline quite quickly. Uh, so it's it's uh, important to to recognize the the quality of uh, of uh, work that goes behind developing these courses. We definitely have the recorded lectures that make it convenient for you to listen to them whenever uh, you're free. We do try to have live lectures um, three three or four times during our. Uh, programs. Let's see. Um, so as we said, and also there's a help desk that's uh, available 24-7. If uh, Thank you, Bill, for all your helpful information on the program. Uh, this is Kelly again in the admissions um, department. And uh, we're here to kind of um, highlight requirements. So all um, applications are processed through SOFIS for the master's programs and SOFIS Express for the certificate. Uh, you do need a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university. There's a minimum of two years of health-related work experiencing experience, uh, preferably focusing on low and middle-income countries or underserved um, populations. Uh, you may combine um, applicable volunteer experience, for example, working for the Peace Corps, uh, towards that required uh, work experience. Uh, a resume or CV needs to be uploaded into the application portal. One to three le letters of recommendation, highlighting the applicant's 
compatibility with the program. One recommendation letter is needed for the certificate and three for the master's program. The statement of purpose is an important part of your file. Um, make sure that you're demonstrating uh, your career goals with the specific educational goals um, and objectives of this program. For our international students, there's um, a couple additional uh, uh, steps in the admission process. Uh, you may need to show profic proficiency in English. And if degrees are completed outside of the US, uh, a course by course evaluation uh, is needed and we recommend using uh, WES or World Education Service. Uh, completed files are reviewed on a monthly basis and we strongly encourage students to apply early. Um, the file deadline is July 1st. Uh, we do want to work actively with you to put together a strong file, so applying early is very, again, very, very important uh, with our one start a year. Uh, this year it is September 4th, so that is a, uh, a Tuesday. The following start would be uh, in the fall of 2019. So you can see the uh, current tuition cost listed per credit of 1,091. We do have scholarships available to all applicants who do get accepted into the program. That's $419 per credit. So the cost to the student is $672 per credit, again, at the current tuition amount. Uh, again, you do not have to do any different application scholarship uh, with your um, application that automatically uh, qualifies you for the uh, scholarship. Uh, we do show the phone number. I um, apologize for the technical uh, difficulties we're having. All right, I think that cleared up, thank you. Um, so you can see on the screen if you want uh, additional information on uh, financial aid, there's the phone number and the email address uh, for um, uh, federal student loans and information on um, private loans as well. So uh, myself, Kelly, and the others that I work with in the admissions office, we are here to answer your questions. We do have time now for um, some questions, but you can see how you can contact us for any questions that weren't answered um, during this question and answered uh, time. So at this time, if you have questions, go ahead and uh, type that in the um, the chat box. It should be on the lower right-hand corner. Okay, we do have a question. Um, Bill, could you give us uh, an example of a good candidate's um, application? Okay, well, so far, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, um, we've only gotten about four or five so far, but uh, basically what we're looking for are uh, people, again, who have had 
I mean, it's not absolutely necessary that you have a degree in, you know, first degree in health, but if you have something in social science, if you have something, uh, we've had people in uh, that have done a bachelor's in nursing, uh, people who have done some uh, science degrees, uh, people who have done even international relations. Um, so at least that gets people oriented. I mean, obviously there's some people who are, you know, recent graduates, some people who had been to uh, university like 10 years ago. So uh, we certainly don't put all of our, you know, emphasis on the degree. Um, but again, we, we and also look for people who, you know, have a, a relatively strong GPA. And I mean, relative, you know, around at least 3.0. But again, we'll consider the circumstances. One of the big things that we're interested in is your experience. Have you worked either in a, in a health-related program or a social service type of program or community development program? Uh, anything that is um, oriented toward, toward service. Um, if you have done volunteer work, for example, we have uh, we've seen people who maybe have only been doing clinical or laboratory work for their main activity, but then they take off time and have done um, special uh, like internships and and volunteer work over the summer in a, in a uh, developing country. So so the exper volunteer experience in addition to your work experience is all considered. Uh, the one thing that we really want to see is in the statement, uh, the personal statement, is that the applicants can explain why they really want to do this program, how it's appropriate for them, how they want to use it, you know, what their career goals are, you know, making it real that we can feel why they really want to be part of this. And again, as we said, are you going to be working toward more toward the management level? Or are you going to be wanting to be involved in community programming? So, you know, trying to um, gear your your statement to explaining what it is about you, your background, and your future goals that make you somebody who wants to be appropriate for be appropriate for one or the other degrees. The other thing that we really are looking for is if you you know get your uh, reference letters in on time, but we want to make sure the people that are writing these letters for you know you. Uh, they can explain to us why they think you are appropriate for our program so that to see that they have given it some thought. Um, it's not just a matter of walking down <laughs> the hallway in your in your office and say, oh, you, you, and you write me a letter. You know, you really want to uh, have people who have, uh, you know, you've spent time with, who know you academically or know you work-wise and can say that, yes, these are the characteristics that you would bring to the program. This is why you would be appropriate to our program. So I think that type of thing, the personal statements, the reference letters, the experience, the, that's uh, definitely important because, again, the name of the program is Applied Science. So we want people who can, you know, who are willing to get out there and work and apply the, the knowledge to, uh, as we say at Hopkins, save lives millions at a time. Uh, thanks. So I have another question that ties in with what you just uh, touched on as far as references. Um, we have someone who's been out of school for uh, many years, and they want to know if an academic reference is required. Uh, well, in that particular case, I mean, there there are situations where people have kept in touch with their lecturers or professors over the years, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, to just to let them know how they're doing, whether it's uh, to gain, you know, some additional information. In that case, if there is somebody you've been, you know, in touch with, you know, over the years, then, then that would be appropriate. But uh, if not, um, then people who um, you work with um, basically, we would not necessarily value a family friend, uh, you know, that type of thing, or or um, a, a personal friend or somebody that's sitting at the next desk, but somebody who has a chance to, you know, to supervise you, to observe your work, to, uh, um, you know, to be able to talk about the quality of, of your contribution to the organization that you work in. 
Bill, you had mentioned earlier that there is some flexibility in the program that you can take one class at a time. Uh, and it's normally structured as two classes per eight, eight week term, but you can take one class. Can you confirm the number of hours again um, of the work that is required each week? Um, well, I think um, if well, well, the uh, the old rule of thumb was if you take a three credit course, then you you know you would have approximately three hours or so of lectures, and then but you would have out of class, you know, studying and homework and other things like that. So, you know, so for one one credit hour where you would, you know, uh, listen to a lecture for an hour, you would probably be doing readings and, and other kinds of assignments for another, at least another couple of hours. So uh, that's, that's the, the sort of the old rule of thumb to figure out how much time you need to devote. And like you said, if you don't have a lot of time, you know, because of uh, work and family commitments, uh, that type of thing. Um, like I say, even our reg uh, even our MPH students, uh, if they're doing the online version, have up many of them take up to four years to to finish the program. So, taking just one course per term. Uh, the main issue of making two available in a term is that if people who are U.S. citizens and get a you know some sort of financial aid, they're required as part-time students to take six hours of credit but if you're living in Malawi or Thailand if you're from Malawi or Thailand you're not going to get US government uh, um, you know uh, financial aid so it's not relevant to you uh, so what is relevant to probably majority of people is do I have the time and energy to uh, to take two courses at once um, and if I do I'll finish sooner um, but otherwise um, you know, you can can spread it out according to you, to what you know you can afford, and both in terms of time and and money. Would you say that if a student is taking the two classes uh, in an eight week term, that about sixteen to twenty hours each week should be anticipated? Yeah. Um, and again, you know, we we tried to gear things like assignments that they're due over the on the weekend end of the weekend, so that people would, you know, have have uh, the weekend to to work on their assignments and to to catch up on all their uh, their readings and things. So, um, you know, that that's that's a, that's another thing we try to take that into account. Okay, we have another question: uh, Is there any work being done with underserved? communities in the U.S.? Well, like I said, even, even in, in our own uh, programs, like like in our, uh, we have four major divisions within our department, and one of them is human nutrition. And <clears throat> people in that department work with uh, uh, issues like, you know, in, in poor urban area, inner city areas with what they call food deserts and what can be done to improve that. They they work with the nutritional status of uh, First Nations populations in, in Canada. So uh, they work with the Native American populations. They work with uh, immigrant populations, um, you know, like uh, people from uh, Laos or Cambodia living in Minneapolis or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, people do, you know, like I said, it's global. And so uh, there, you know, there are common threads in terms of people who are underserved. A great question. But again, if that's if that's somebody's focus, you know, again, it's important to uh, to stress that on the personal statement how you're going to use this this course. Uh, another question: Does the faculty manage any projects overseas or locally that students could get involved with? Um. In, in in yes, in theory, in practice, um, you know, it it depends on where people are are actually located. For for the um, for the uh, what do you call it? For the integrated uh, experience, integrative activity, uh, that the the amount of time available for that usually would probably not be enough to really travel out, but. Um, you know, I, I think as one gets to meet faculty and learn about what they are involved in, um, you know, 
opportunities may come up. I mean, some of our programs in, you know, at school require students to do a practicum or do an internship placement of four months. Uh, we don't re require that for the, uh, for the uh, Master of Applied Science, but clearly students do get involved in faculty projects, um, you know, so, so it, it's not, it's, it's possible. All right, thank you. Um, the rest of the questions are very specific, so I think they would be better answered um, uh, with someone in our admissions team. Uh, so oh, okay. Feel free. Yeah, so uh, just because they're just very, very specific, it's not a general question. So we would be happy to answer those questions for you. Um, we'll pull back up the, the slide with the contact information. Uh, we do look forward to um, being of, of assistance to you with your questions and helping you move forward with um, the program of interest to you. Thank you so much for attending. Um, we really appreciate um, having such a, um, a, a talented uh, program director um, presenting tonight. Thank you, Bill. Well, thank you. I'm glad you all could, uh, could join us. Good night. Good night.